the mystery of cosmogenesis. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, monsters and serpents, to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. This is, uh, we've got a very, very interesting and special show for you guys, uh, this week. And it was actually, we gotta say, we gotta put out a big thanks to George Howard of the Cosmic Tusk. Thanks, buddy! Yeah, for setting this up for us. Um, uh, we have a long interview with Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation, uh, and you guys will see what the topic was we went through many topics but the but panspermia and uh and a universal uh biosphere basically is what we're talking about the fact that that life itself may be a universal and fundamental phenomenon that is just like randall talks about how we need to be aware of our cosmic environment in terms of impactors and effects that it's had on earth in the past that uh, uh, Dr. Chandra is saying that this is also the case with biology. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Right. And you can find uh, a lot of his work on the Cosmic Tusk website. Uh, yes, George that's right. Howard is uh, putting putting papers up and everything of, of Dr. Chandra's work. So go there, check it out as well. Yeah. And a lot of these papers that are, especially the ones that are referencing the, you know, the current conditions with COVID-19, uh, are short. So, I mean, you know, the longest one I think was eight pages, but there's a couple other ones that are two or three long and they're just, they're just full of fascinating snippets. And he worked on these with multiple, uh, very highly respected scientists in their fields, uh, you know, bringing together, you know, it's a multidisciplinary efforts and they are looking at, um, like non-standard model, uh, effects of how this, wh where this virus may have come from, and they're showing all this evidence that, like, look, it doesn't, it isn't happening like we would think it what uh, we would think it does if we're just using the standard model of viral infection. So, yeah, pushing the paradigm again. That's right, always pushing the paradigm. And uh, so we were happy to have him on the podcast, and we will get to that interview shortly. But first, let's go ahead and do space weather news from spaceweather.com. Solar wind incoming. A minor stream of solar wind is approaching Earth. Estimated time of arrival, March 30th through 31st. Flowing from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere, the incoming stream could spark springtime auroras around the Arctic Circle. Uh, and that's it for the space weather news today because there is nothing happening on the sun. Sunspot's number is zero. Current conditions, solar wind speed are 392.1 kilometers per second. And the density is a mid-level 5.6 protons per cubic centimeter. That's right. Crickets on the sun. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and introduce Dr. Chandra N. C. Wickramasinghe, was one of the, is one of the greatest living astronomers of our time. He was born into the British imperial nation of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, in 1939. As a boy, he excelled at mathematics and demonstrated a, sup a supremely curious mind. He sat for his entrance at the Royal College of Colombo at age 11 to study mathematics and graduated at 17. Wow. Yeah. He won a Commonwealth scholarship awarded to the brightest students of the empire and sailed to England 19, in 1960 to enter Trinity College, Cambridge, to gain his PhD. He was awarded a PhD degree in mathematics in 1963 and was elected a fellow of Jesus College in Cambridge in the same year. In the following year, he was appointed a staff member of the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge. Here he began his pioneering work on the nature of interstellar dust, publishing many papers in this field that led to important paradigm shifts in astronomy. He published the first definitive book on interstellar grains in 1967. In 1973, he was awarded Cambridge University's highest academic decoration, Doctor of Science. At Cambridge, he began a nearly 40-year collaboration with British Britain's most popular and decorated living scientist of the time, his mentor, Sir Fred Hoyle. Hoyle and Wick Ramasinghe, uh, Wick Ramasinghe fought a pitched scientific battle in major scientific journals in an effort to prove that life is an omnipotent cosmic phenomena present in comets, asteroids, and indeed makes up the galactic dust clouds. Wick Ramasinghe has recently published four shocking new notifications related to the coronavirus, 
one of them on November 25th, 2019, warning of a pandemic this winter. He believes that the virus came to Earth as they have regularly since ancient times by means of cometary dust entering the atmosphere and releasing entrapped viral particles. And Dr. C, as George Howard calls him, published over 350 papers in major scientific journals, over 75 in the journal Nature. In 1974, he proposed the theory that dust in interstellar space and in comets was largely organic, a theory that has now been vindicated. He's also an award-winning poet and personal friend of Sir Arthur C. Clarke. He is a polymath genius and possibly the smartest snake we've ever had in the snake pit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, this is our interview with Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe. Yeah, the beginning of this story really goes back to the early 1970s when together with the late Sir Fred Hoyle, I began to explore the properties of cosmic dust, these vast clouds of dark material that are in interspersed between the stars in the Milky Way. And the question is, what are these dust particles made of? There are trillions of these dust particles. And because there are so many, uh, and because they are of sizes that are similar to the size of the wavelength of light, they block the light of distant stars. And that's why we see these dark striations of different shapes, elephants' trunks and so forth, right across the, the Milky Way. So in the 19, late 1960s, it was firmly believed that the dust, interstellar dust, was made of inorganic material. And mostly water ice was what they thought, thought this stuff was made of. Mm. Now, when I began to re-examine the whole question of what the dust is made of, it quickly t turned out that the ice particle model was simply wrong. It didn't fit the data that was available even towards the end of the 1960s. By the 1970s, there were new techniques being uh, developed in astronomy, uh, one of the techniques being infrared astronomy, and using the latest data on the infrared spectrum of dust, I was able to show that the dust was not inorganic, certainly not ice crystals, but much more uh, in the form of organic particles. Organic particles with co really complex arrangements of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth. Uh, so this was in the very early 1970s, and throughout the 1970s, all the way to 1979, we were exploring ways in which such organic dust could be produced without the intervention of life, any life process. So we were thinking of sort of chemistry um, that might have been going on in space and so on. But we quickly came to the conclusion that the, the idea of chemistry alone producing this vast quantity of organic material, organic molecules, uh, didn't really seem to fit anything. And uh, we, in fact, Fred Hoyle and I made a prediction uh, and, uh, and told astronomers that they should look at the deepest source of infrared light in the galaxy, because as I told you, infrared astronomy was uh, developing to a high level of precision at the time. Uh, so I, we told astronomers that they should look in the, the deepest parts of the galaxy and see what the infrared uh, spectrum is like, because that infrared source of infrared radiation would have to cross all of the dust between the center of the galaxy to us. And in doing so, in going through this huge path length of millions of light years, uh, we argued that the signature of a bacterium should be imprinted on the dust if the, if the dust was in fact bacteria and or viruses. So astronomers then looked at this proposal and said it is crazy, we won't do this because we can't waste our time. And fortunately for me, I had a brother who was at Austin, he was a professor of mathematics in Australia at the Australian National University, ANU, 
And he had access to the most powerful telescope at the time, which was the Anglo-Australian telescope. So we uh, got hold of him and asked him, can he look at the uh, at this source of radiation and see whether there was a signature of a bacterium? So at the beginning, he also was really dismissive. He didn't think that anything interesting would come out, out of it because uh, he thought this was all sort of signed and sealed. It was all inorganic and so on. But eventually he did make this do this experiment. And lo and behold, what turned up was precisely the signature of a bacterium, the infrared spectrum of a bacterium. Now, how could this be? I mean, we ourselves, myself and Fred Hall and our team in Cardiff at the time, we were absolutely convinced that uh, this had to be the, so, and that there's no other way to explain it. it. There had better be bacteria and viruses in between us and the and this uh, source of light at the center of the galaxy. So we published papers and argued for this and uh, uh, and so on, and it went on for a couple of years. Uh, it was sort of ferociously refuted by people. Even people like Carl Sagan said these molecules and these structures cannot survive in space, so there has to be some other explanation for for the um, the new observations. But 20, 30, 40 years have passed, and no other explanation has come up that is any good. So we have this ancient, now sort of 1980, observation that is firmly pointing in the direction of huge, vast quantities of bacteria and viruses in the space between the stars. So that was uh, one step in the direction of vindicating the idea that life is a truly cosmic phenomenon. And then another strand of the, uh, our argument was to try to re-examine the old story that life emerged on the Earth, uh, the first life emerged on the Earth in a primordial soup. And this is what uh, kids have been taught from pretty close to the beginning of the last century. They said this, they were told that this is absolutely definite. Uh, there's no no questioning possible of, of the hypothesis. And we began to explore this, examine this as closely as we could. And then we, to our horror, we discovered that there was absolutely no evidence for it. It was a, it was a, essentially almost a, a religious belief that was dinned into scientists, and they had some feeble arguments to say that this is proven, uh, but it was not proven one bit. So, uh, so again, again, we began to think more deeply about it, and then it turned out that when you really analyze the probability of life starting in any situation on the Earth, primordial soup, or millions of primordial soups, the odds against the molecules, the sort of like amino acids and nucleic acids, nucleotides, arranging themselves in a manner that would uh, do anything like life is utterly, utterly impossible. Uh, I mean, it's and we had many similes, many comparisons. We, in one one of our publications, we said it is like to say that life emerged in a primordial soup on the Earth. Random shuffling of of simple molecules is like saying that a tornado blowing through a junkyard would assemble a fully working Boeing 747. <laughs> I mean, that, was, yeah. that was a classic, classic quotation that's been repeated everywhere in, ever since. So, I mean, that's the, the sheer improbability of doing anything that is remotely like putting life together from uh, its component molecules in a, in a small terrestrial planet is something that is now just impossible, utterly impossible. And people are beginning to realize that, uh, but it's not really something that that the scientists like to accept, uh, having been brainwashed into the opposite situation for so long, brainwashed into believing that they have an explanation for a life emerging on the Earth. And that's totally erroneous. There's no evidence whatsoever. So given that backdrop, then the, the bigger question is, 
uh, we are connected, the Earth is connected to the much huge universe outside. Our biosphere, we used to think, we, we, we have been accustomed to, be, we are taught to think that the biosphere of the Earth, the living sphere of the Earth, maybe extends to the depths of the ocean and to perhaps uh, 10 kilometers into the atmosphere, but no, nothing beyond that. Now, what we are finding from our astronomy and from our studies is that the biosphere of the Earth extends all the way to the remotest edges of the galaxy, maybe even beyond the galaxy. So in that context, it is not at all uh, unreasonable to suggest that the whole of the evolution of life is one in, is, is in a, happens in a connected biosphere. So we have bacteria and viruses coming into the Earth and, and, and coming in on a regular basis. We have comets coming occasionally in large large comets sort of banging on the Earth and causing destruction of life and uh, climate changes and so on. The, uh, that's, that's generally coming to be accepted. But the, 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 the thesis that life itself is connected to the bigger universe is still uh, a matter of really huge emotional hurdle in terms of uh, acceptance. People don't like to extend their, uh, the remit of life or earth life outside of the earth. Uh, so when you talk about bacteria now coming into the earth, uh, there's huge uh, general sort of wall of disbelief, uh, and that still operates in a big way. But uh, in recent times, um, in the last uh, 20 years, really, that's not so recent, but in the last 20 years, there have been experiments that have been done to try to see if there are bacteria very, very high up in the stratosphere. The first such uh, decisive experiments were done in 2001 and 2002 uh, by myself in collaboration with a team of Indian scientists at the Indian Space Research Organization. And already in, 19, in 2002, we found that there are bacteria, new types of bacteria were discovered at 41 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And this is high enough, uh, 41 kilometers is um, high enough to say that it is extremely unlikely that Earth microbes are lifted to that height in normal times. So if you're finding these bacteria, then the odds of them coming from space uh, are much, much stronger than any possibility of, uh, of uh, the stuff being lifted from the ground. Now, that's not the end of the story, because um, if you go to the very recent, sort of two years ago, uh, Russian astronauts um, on the International Space Station, and now we are at uh, 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface, they have discovered microorganisms on the outside of the windows of the International Space Station in between cleaning operations, right? So from time to time, there's service operations that take place. Uh, astronauts go there and service the station, clean the station. In between cleaning operations, these bacteria have been detected not once, but six times in the last 10 years. Yeah. So this, we published this along with the Russian scientists, and this is in a recent paper. And again, the prima facie argument for saying that these came from space rather than from the Earth is now getting even stronger than the 2001 claim that we had from 41 kilometers. If 41 kilometers is difficult to get up to, then 400 kilometers is, is virtually impossible. So that's where we stand in relation to the bacteria and viruses and so on. Well, we know that, that in the past we've been, you know, the planet has been bombarded by uh, comet fragments or meteorites that, you know, could have also thrown stuff into the stratosphere and perhaps into orbit, dust and, and whatnot. You think it, I mean, I really like the idea of the, you know, the, sort of the panspermia idea, the fact that, the idea that these things are all over the place, but yeah, could it be from, yeah. could, like, uh, earlier 
terrestrial impacts yeah, that threw they, this they stuff up there. Yeah, yeah, most certainly. I mean, not not up into the stratosphere. They would have gone much further in the stratosphere. Yeah. We we worked out uh, my colleague and I in the nineteen uh, in the early in the two thousands. We worked out the uh, the possibility of of the Cretaceous tertiary impact, which was the extinction mm -hmm. of the dinosaurs, right? Sixty five million years ago, there was a huge comet impact, and that impact would not only have killed the comet, uh, killed the dinosaurs. But it would have it would have thrown out material, surface material, from the Earth and uh, into orbit, in, in, into uh, just escape the gravity of the Earth, and um, also ex escape solar gravity oh, eventually yeah. <laughs> and go into space. So we are awesome. seeding. Yeah, you know, it's awesome. And I think there's no question that our our planet, which is laden with life, has been laden with life for four billion years or so. Uh, we have been seeding space with the, with the life that is around here, with little maybe viruses, bacteria, seeds, who knows what. I mean, all of the evolutionary uh, experience in terms of evolution of life, all those bits and pieces uh, are just flung all over the place. And we know that the solar system does a huge trek around this uh, around the center of the galaxy once every 250 million years or so, right? It's a huge orbit. Right. And it's, uh, uh, so it's the Earth and the solar system has gone around the center of the galaxy many, many times since uh, life started on the Earth and life evolved on the Earth. So we've been seeding all these uh, millions and billions of protoplanets and, and exoplanets uh, oh, around the whole of the galaxy. <laughs> So there's no there's no way in which we can say that we are disconnected from yeah. the bigger yeah. universe. And so when people tell me uh, that when, when we talked about disease, and maybe let's come to diseases from space that uh, we, we are really very interested in these days uh, because of this uh, uh, coronavirus. From time immemorial, I think human beings in various different civilizations over the whole planet have argued that comets bring both life and death, right? right. And comets right. have been connected, have been linked to pestilences and plagues and so on in many different cultures. And uh, we have tended, in modern scientific cultures, we've tended to uh, regard these as, as uh, ancient primitive superstitions of people who didn't know anything, know anything about anything at all, and so we discard them. But now I think it's come a full circle around to almost to reality. We're seeing evidence for uh, a connection between uh, viruses from outside and life on our planet. Yeah, and um, it's really interesting, too, that you look back through the geological record and you see these, you know, the, the mass extinction events are then followed by an explosion of all kinds of new life that we see in the fossil record. Absolutely. Which is just absolutely. The, the Cambrian explosion is one yes. such explosion, isn't it? And that was preceded by impacts, and there's no question about it because we've discovered craters, we've discovered uh, evidence of impacts that took place prior to the big explosion of life. So. So it's uh, it's a continuing record of uh, destruction and and rebirth, as it were, of life or renewal of life, and the renewal doesn't come from from the earth itself. I think the evidence now points to the renewal and the, um, the effect of the impacts being the most important contributor to the surges of evolution that we see. So the entire pattern of uh, evolution of life is connected with uh, with uh, cosmic bacteria and viruses <clears throat> so that's the that's where we stand at the moment so against that backdrop one has to take seriously the possibility that occasionally you would have viruses and bacteria that come onto the earth that have a mismatch with certain evolved life forms and can cause diseases, pandemics of disease. And the first such pandemic that is on record in the um, modern scientific era, just before the modern scientific era, in fact, was in 1918, um, 1919 
in so-called influenza pandemic. At the time, they didn't know it was influenza. It was just a, a horrendous, what it's called, a Spanish flu, they called it, but they didn't know that it was caused by a virus. And it's called Spanish flu, not because it started in Spain, but because all of the rest of Europe was involved in a dreadful war. And the Spanish newspapers are the only uh, pr sort of press that uh, the publications that came from Spain recorded these events for the first time. So that's why it's called Spanish flu. But the the facts about uh, around this uh, epidemic is really quite interesting because the first cases of the the, the influence of 1918-1919 pandemic that caused huge numbers of deaths, something like 500 million deaths, I think, across the whole, or 50 million deaths, isn't it, at least? Yeah, 50 million 50 deaths million, across yeah. Yeah, across the world. Uh, the, the, the lethal brand of that flu came on the same day, appeared on the same day in Bombay, India, and Boston in the United States. Absolutely the same day, bang on the same day. You had hundreds of people dying on the uh, railway stations in India. There, there were dead bodies in the in the carriages of the of the of the railway carriages and so on. And uh, likewise, there was a lot of huge uh, impact on on Boston. And but the way in which the uh, uh, so in those days, of course, in those days, 1918, 1919, there was no air travel, so there was no way in which humans could have taken the the new pathogen from Mumbai to to Bombay to Boston or, or the other way around. So it it just fell from the skies, is the obvious implication, fell in these two places for the first time. And then even the subsequent spread of that um, virus or the disease, it was really quite mysterious. You had... Um, communities, remote communities in Alaska, totally disconnected from the rest of the United States, coming down just almost on the same day, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people dying of this influenza. And uh, it was from, in fact, from the deaths that resulted in Alaska that people have been able to, um, subsequently in the last 20 years, or 30 years, being able to exhume some of the bodies that were buried in perm permafrost and actually isolate uh, a virus that it was recognized as the influenza virus, the influenza virus that caused uh, the pandemic or presumably caused this huge, devastating pandemic uh, in the U.S. The uh, lessons we learned from the 1918-1919 pandemic is really, they're quite important because uh, first and foremost, it didn't look as though person-to-person -person spread was the, the main mode of uh, propagation of the virus. As I said, it appeared on the, uh, on the same day in Boston and Bombay. No way in which human travel could have taken a virus across or a pathogen across in a day or less than a day. In those days, it took... Uh, at least three months or so, or more than three months to travel between the United States and India. Uh, and um, yet within the States also, the spread is was very, very haphazard and occurred sort of really sporadically. And isolated communities were suddenly um, attacked on, on almost on the same day. They were affected. Thousands of people died in Alaska and so forth. So person-to-person -person spread, while it, it must have happened, was not the the only mode of spread of the virus. It fell from the skies. There seems to be very powerful evidence that it fell from the skies. And um, uh, since then, since 1918-1919, the, the virus has been isolated it, uh, and, and sequenced. Uh, and that's found to be the... Oh, the, the flu that's called H1N1, a, a classification of the flu uh, called H1N1. And um, uh, variants of this flu have recurred from 1918, 1919, all the, way, all the way to the present day. And even there's a seasonal flu that can be regarded as a variant of that 
first flu, that influenza that um, hit in 1918, 1919. Now, so that's the, the backdrop of uh, influenza pandemics. And fortunately for us, for Fred Hoyle and myself, we had the opportunity of analyzing the epidemiology of, uh, of what was called a red flu pandemic. It was called red flu because it was started, it apparently started for the first time in, uh, in the Soviet Union um, in 1976. And 1976, 1977, it was um, affecting school children in England and Wales and all, all over Europe, in fact. But we took the chance of using kids and schools as so almost like detectors of the virus. We went to many, many schools and got data and, and the timing of their attacks and illness and so forth. And we, we, we wrote our book called Diseases from Space after, after that event, after the 1976-77 red flu pandemic. And we found in, in, in our researchers, we found what we considered to be uh, convincing evidence that person-to-person -person spread was not the only, or no, was not the main mode of propagation of this virus. It was essentially falling from the skies and affecting different uh, groups of people, different populations, in a very sort of higgledy-piggledy manner. Mm. So whilst there was some person-to-person -person spread, the, the main effect that we were able to detect and um, separate from the, the slow person-to-person -person spread was sort of massive infalls of the virus occurring in sort of regions of different sizes and different places, just like what happened in the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic. So, okay, you, I don't want to, I want to back up a little bit here because I have some yes. questions about the, the more of the panspermia aspect. Um, yeah. But so one of the things that they'll say that I've read in many places, you know, is that these organisms or even the viruses can't exist in deep space because there's hard radiation and then there's high energy, you know, e, like gamma, gamma light. So <laughs> how, how do you think that, the, that they would survive that? I know that we find extremophiles here that survive in, yeah, in crazy yeah. environments. Well, well the, 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 the sort of breeding ground, the amplification sites for bacteria and viruses in deep space right through the universe is in, we think, in objects like uh, icy planetesimals, icy comets. And uh, icy comets are not all frozen because we know that uh, there's a lot of evidence from the comets that they have had uh, watery interiors at some part time in their history ah. because they, can, they have radioactive heat sources and the interiors of comets uh, tend to be liquid. And so you get uh, warm liquid environments in which bacteria and viruses could uh, and, and living cells could be... Uh, protected completely from external radiation. While they're inside a comet, there's no problem at all. When they are released into, into uh, space from comets that are sort of fragmenting and getting into little small pieces, then the, uh, the fragments themselves are of sizes where the protection is sort of almost built in. Ah. If you have a millimeter-sized particle in which there are bacteria, then the, the, the bacteria inside, the, the viruses inside that particle would be completely protected because the, the overlying material um, uh, sort of shields the, the bacteria from uh, radiations, harmful radiations. But having said that, I mean, the, the recent uh, experiments on the International Space Station, in the laboratories and so on, have turned up with very surprising results, results that have surprised the, the conservative scientists who maintained for a very long time that bacteria and viruses cannot survive in space. In fact, extremophiles, you mentioned that, there are extreme t types of bacteria that can uh, withstand extreme conditions of heat, radiation, and so on. And, uh, those are well known and well documented. But within the interior of a, of, of a micrometeorite or of, a, of an icy um, conglomerate of particles, then there's enough shielding 
uh, from the exterior, outside material for the for the um, the virus or the bacterium to be protected from ultraviolet and from uh, from radiations that are damaging. I mean, the X-rays and so on go through these particles, but the uh, uh, but the X-ray tolerance is high enough from what we know of uh, from studies on the Earth that a very large fraction of these would would survive. Ah. And as long as I said, as long as they're inside of these objects, and for most of their lives, they will be inside uh, large uh, cometary type bodies, they will be protected almost for an eternity. Ah. So I have a follow-up question to that. We've, we have gathered materials and samples from the moon. Have they ever looked at these samples or tested these samples to see if there are uh, remnants of viruses or bacteria in these samples we've not, gotten? Not as much as they should have. What they did in the early days when they collected uh, samples from the moon was to look for uh, bacteria and therefore didn't find any. But uh, you wouldn't, if if a bacteria, the moon has no atmosphere at all. So if if you have a, a conglomerate of particles, a millimeter sized blob of ice material, icy material with bacteria and viruses slamming at 10 kilometers a second on the surface of the moon, uh, it, it'd be instantly gasified. You wouldn't get anything surviving. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that that is one reason why I wouldn't expect uh, living material to have survived on the moon. So it would need some kind yeah. of nucleus that that did not get vaporized, basically, in order. Yeah, to... yeah, that's the idea. On, on the on the north, on the polar polar regions of the moon, there are there's recently been discovered that there there's, there's sort of icy ice caps on the pole, the north pole of the moon, isn't it? And they and here this it is possible that there might be. Maybe bacteria lurking in the uh, underneath the ice. Perhaps we have we don't know that yet. But wherever there are possible um, survival niches for bacteria in the solar system, I think there's undoubtedly going to be uh, discoveries that would show that these are there. Uh, example, for example, on the on Mars, there's bound to be uh, on the. Um, Icy moons of Jupiter. It's absolutely certain that I'm absolutely certain that there's going to be bacteria and viruses and and, and unicellular life at the very least in the um, in the oceans of uh, of Enceladus and uh, Europa, for instance. Yeah, these are things for the future. But I think I think the it's the, 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 it's, it's quite clear that um, the possibilities exist for life being essentially everywhere in the solar system where there are conditions for survival. Wow, that's, that's awesome. So, so the idea, and uh, you know, it's interesting to me how this concept is resisted by the academic community in some cases and the wider scientific community, but it, it, it does seem like if this is the case and you know, if this stuff is constantly or almost constantly raining down onto the earth in some way or another, uh, like you were saying, they're finding it in the uh, way up in the upper atmosphere and even stuck to the space station. In some cases, we we on this on our show we call that space plankton. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah right. I mean, the, 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 the surprise is that it hasn't been taken seriously by and and been followed up because we as soon as the discovery was reported by the Russians that there was space plankton or bacteria on the on the outside of the space station, the have thought that. There's many other organizations like NASA and even maybe the Chinese space agencies would have gone there and confirmed it. And in fact, they've done nothing. They've not, they've not denied it. They have not confirmed it. So there's a sort of a wall of silence that seems to be operating to generally say nothing of the possibility that life exists outside the Earth. Maybe it's something deeply psychological human psychology maybe operates against uh, admit, admitting that uh, we are not alone right that's and that's what's interesting to me because if this is happening to the earth all the time then it's happening everywhere uh all of the time you know this Coper the, the copernican idea that space is basically the same in any direction so if we have this stuff raining down on the earth all the time then it should be raining everywhere and that means that Absolutely. the yeah. yeah yeah 
Yeah, the components are the building blocks of life, the building blocks and complex, really complex building blocks of life that got together on the earth across millions, billions of years and led to the whole, the entire panorama of life, uh, including ourselves. That process must surely have taken place on billions of other planets because we know that these planets exist now, isn't it? The extraplanet discoveries are, are quite firm. And they're, they're still very, very, it's early days and the discoveries have been few and far between. But there's bound to be billions of these Earth-like planets in our, in our Milky Way alone. So, the, uh, uh, so you would expect life to be really quite widespread. And in that context, the, you've got to look at these uh, events like diseases because uh, viruses bring evolutionary potential and ever since the human genome was fully sequenced uh, we have discovered that the human genome consists of a vast quantity maybe 20 30 percent of it is in the form of uh, of sort of bits of viruses of defunct viruses and mm. of right across and they used to be called it used to be called junk dna yes but now it's been identified as uh, as relics, relics of past invasions. Yeah, right. we, we were talking about that earlier when we were looking into your work uh, about how that makes so much sense. You know, this 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 big mystery of what is all this junk DNA that it's yeah. that if this was uh, cosmogenic, then it yeah. would make sense that we would have all these different components that came from different uh, planetary systems or solar systems that yeah. had different conditions. And so yeah. they're not useful to us here yeah. in this condition. So they get tucked away. Right. They get tucked and away. That, and that brings up that, that study they did with the twins, where one twin went up into the space station for a year, came back yeah. down, and the, you know his telomeres were longer, and there were other parts of his gen genes that were, or his uh, DNA that were activated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot of lot of ignorance and a lot of arrogance and so on that uh, we've got to combat in the 21st century, isn't it? I think there's there's a, there's a lot of uh, possibilities that we have to uh, take up and and explore to our benefit rather than keep denying the the facts and turning away from facts, and and that's something that seems to be happening all the time. Right, it does, and. Uh, I so you talked about, I, I was fascinated by this part of, of some of your studies, that there's this idea that, that, the, uh, that the, the ability to speak may have come from something like this. Didn't you talk about that, the, the, the genetics? Yeah, part? Uh, yeah, yeah. The, um, the gene that allows us to speak and to articulate appears to have emerged fairly suddenly in the, in the record of uh, ancestors of, from great apes to hominids and so on. It appeared in some one place maybe. And the doubling and the size of the human skull also suddenly doubled in the course of the uh, last 200,000 years or so. All of these could have been um, could have been caused by viruses, I think. And the involvement of viruses in all of these evolution, major evolution steps uh, appears to be generally considered to be plausible now. Even the even the emergence of placenta, I'll go back further in time in, in the evolution of humans, the emergence of placental mammals seems to have been connected with a huge amount of viruses that uh, came into the earth and uh, affected and changed the, the um, reproduction patterns of the animals that were before. So the whole of uh, the whole of evolution has essentially been all of the evolution of life has been modulated and controlled. It appears through viruses, and there's so many viruses. I mean, that's another thing that is only recently been uh, discovered. If you take a single drop of ocean water, apparently there is something like a million individual viruses. One drop of ocean water has a million individual viruses. No one knows where wow. it came from doesn't last there forever because it's broken up by sunlight. So it's constantly coming down. And uh, only last, I think the last year or two years ago, there was a group of American, Canadian, European scientists who spent a whole year 
on the uh, tops of, uh, in Spain, they're called Sierra Nevada, Mount, Nevada Mountains, right? They're four kilometers high, and they had collecting devices to collect all of the, the mist and, and stuff that fell from above from above the atmospheric boundary layer, as it's called. And what they concluded, what they found over a whole year, was that um, there was an average of one billion, not million, one billion viruses falling on every square meter in every single day. God. Just yeah. unbelievable, right? That's incredible. And then, of course, they report that, and they give all the evidence and the, and the images and the spectra, all the technical details. And then they, of course, say that these must somehow, all of this must somehow have been lifted from the ground and taken to the clouds and just brought back. I mean, some a certain fraction of that must be recycled, but you cannot assume that it all is recycled. Uh, that's, there's no hard evidence for that. And then, in, as it, I think I told you, that we went to 41 kilometers in 2001 with the Indian Space Research Organization, a group of us in the UK, and a group of Indian scientists. And we found uh, bacteria. We sampled uh, the stratosphere, a small volume of the stratosphere. And from that sampling, also we were able to make an estimate of how much, how many bacteria would be falling from 41 kilometers. Now, this is not four kilometers, now we've gone to 41 kilometers. And the infall to the Earth from 41 kilometers averages, guess what? Three tons of microorganisms per day. Wow. Or a million, or in terms of numbers, a million bacteria per square meter, every square meter receives a, a million bacteria per day. <laughs> we don't know how many viruses, maybe about 100 times that virus. And, and of course, everyone says that this is, uh, this, all this stuff is just recycled from the earth. And that is total nonsense because uh, it's true that there may be, a, that, that number is large, a million bacteria per square meter per day on the on the ground coming from the skies. But we, we essentially kick, kick uh, our human activities and animals and so on. We have an indigenous population of bacteria as well, right? That, and that is about maybe many, many times more than those hundred or million bacteria that fall from the skies. So we've got to separate. I think the effort has to be made to separate the small fraction of the uh, cosmic bacteria that are falling from the skies from the indigenous bacteria because um, because all of this stuff essentially also goes into our guts and to our, yeah. what they call micro what they call now these days microbiome isn't it is is uh, it, it's very important in humans yeah. and animals and not only that, but the but the viruses are editing all the bacteria as well. <laughs> you don't have to do it. Yeah. And changing all that and just, man. It's yeah. Just... So it's what's happening. And I, th I think I think there is a slow slow recognition that this is happening, but I think there's also a deep and deeply ingrained resistance to accepting that we are part of this huge cosmic biosphere, we are in control of our destiny, is what we like to think, but we are not. Right. Yeah. The, another thing I wanted to ask you about real quick was the um, uh, the lesions on some Egyptian mummies that were identified as smallpox. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, smallpox has been, uh, is, is a very recognizable disease from its uh, manifestations. One thinks, when, if you look at the lesions on the skins of the mummies and the, the doctors, uh, physicians who looked at it said this has to be smallpox, nothing else. And uh, one has to take their opinion. It's only an opinion. I don't think they've actually identified a, uh, the smallpox virus. I don't believe they have, but right. uh, but uh, it is supposed to be smallpox in the lesions of the, mum in the mummies that go back to what? Three or four thousand BC. Uh, then there is uh, you can so there was more the, the inference is that there was smallpox then, 
Right. It was an endemic disease, or it happened sporadically in the um, uh, in the in the time of the pyramids. And then there's a long gap, and uh, you have the uh, the entire sort of classical period uh, where diseases were recorded pretty accurately by Hippocrates in Greece and so on. And there's no mention of smallpox until you come to the early Christian era. So it seems to be in a sort of a oscillating cycle. Smallpox appears in one epoch and then uh, disappears for a long period and then reappears. And that sort of continues through to modern times. And fortunately now smallpox has been eliminated. But it's been a, it's been a cyclic process as far as we can see from the historical record. It's, it's only a historical record, so you, if you like to discount it and say that this is not reliable, then that's what people tend to do. But uh, but the an anecdotal, the, uh, the other uh, infra, uh, the evidence we have is from detailed descriptions of diseases uh, right through from classical Greece to medieval times, and the plague of Athens is one of the first that it's 429 BC, 429 BC. Uh, the state of Athens was uh, at war with the uh, with the Peloponnesians uh, and uh, with the Spartans, and so they have a, a ten-year war. And in in between that, uh, during the ten-year war, they have the 429 BC is a very famous plague of Athens, and we know a lot about the plague of Athens because there's a historian by name Thucydides who was uh, a victim of that. He, he Apparently, he, he, he succumbed to the, the disease, the virus, or whatever it was, and survived. And he wrote a day-by-day -day description of the, of the disease and how it spread or did not spread, and so on. So we got a very good record of it. And as far as uh, modern medical science is concerned, when they look at the, when modern doctors look at the uh, Thucydidean description, they cannot find any any modern disease, any known disease that match this uh, this plague, uh, the plague of Athens. So it, this, it was a new disease at the time, and probably not repeated. So that's one of the things. And then you've got the bubonic plague that is repeated, that is repeated a few times. Uh, smallpox, as we said, was repeated, and. Um, uh, and yeah, the, there is evidence that some of these other plagues, the later ones, uh, like you were talking about with the Spanish influenza, they kind of show up in multiple places at once or in very isolated areas. Uh, you know, like whole whole little villages were wiped out by some of these plagues and they had no contact with people. You know, and it's just like people eventually, uh, eventually somebody arrives at the village and everyone there is dead. And uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, there, we, we looked at that. I mean, this book, This from Space, is worth reading. It's it's probably out of print, but uh, I'm trying to get it into print again. It's 1977, Diseases from Space by Fred Hoyle and myself. And we, we've been through all of that historical evidence and described it in, in great detail and also described the, uh, the 1977-76-77 influenza pandemic and so forth. Uh, so this has been going on for a long time. The uh, the pattern of diseases that cannot be explained in terms. I mean, you mentioned the isolated communities coming down with the influenza pandemic in 1918, 1919. But also, very very interestingly, you see that ships at sea. Right. In those right. days, it took uh, um, perhaps about three months for a ship to go from England to Australia. And Australia was part of the British Empire, so there was some traffic people going from England to Australia. And right in the middle of cruise of the ship's uh, voyage, you have the whole ship going down with this influenza, <laughs> right? So where did that come from? It obviously came from the skies. Right. It's, <laughs> you, I mean, it, because the, the trips are so long and because of where the ship the, the people on the ship seem to become sick. It couldn't have just been incubated and in, incubating in some person on the ship for that long, uh, Not, and it came, and it couldn't have been sitting on some surface. It, it came down from the sky. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I think the evidence is absolutely crushing now. And with the year, uh, I mean, one doesn't like to trivialize the current COVID outbreak because it's it's really tragic and it's tragic in several different at uh, several different levels. It's tragic for the people who have died very very distressed deaths at that, and some thirty thousand people have died so far. I think. A lot of cases in the U.S. isn't it? Hundred thousand, maybe the U.S. is leading the the uh, the numbers at the, at the present time. Right. So we can't, uh, we shouldn't really talk in terms of uh, we can't trivialize it. But at the same time, I think it's important if you're going to combat diseases like that in the future to try to honestly understand the true cause. Right. I mean, we tend to, the, the, for the influenza 1918, 1919 pandemic, as soon as the virus was discovered in the 1960s or maybe the 70s or something, when it was isolated, they found it was a virus, uh, influenza, they called it influenza, and it was a similar virus that existed in birds and pigs, right? So the story was similar in, in a very general sense, similar. So the story was that it must have come from birds through, and it couldn't, it, it, it cannot apparently transfer from birds to humans because the bird virus doesn't, uh, doesn't infect humans. So it has to go from the bird to an undefined, ill-defined intermediate animal that can switch, do various switches that may make the bird virus a human virus, and then go to the human, right? Mm, right. So that's the story that we are, uh, we are asked to believe, and that's the story, that's the orthodox point of view that has emerged over the last uh, 20, 30 years. Similarly, for the, for the SARS and for the COVID virus, uh, the virus is supposed to be generally similar to a virus that was discovered in bats, right? But the virus in bats cannot go directly to the humans, so it has postulated that the, the virus first goes from the bat to an intermediate animal, and from the intermediate animal to the human. So it's 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 a very it's a very indirect method of transfer, and so that's what people believe. But um, in terms of the epidemiology of the influenza pandemic of 1918, I think. It's much more likely that this was a, a truly cosmic virus, that it came from the skies. And the fact that birds and pigs have similar viruses is, is just because uh, uh, they also, they also uh, get wet in the rain, isn't it? They, they, or they inhale the, the, the mist and the rain, and they, right. they get same, from the same source. And similarly, the, the bats and the pangolins and whatever is postulated for, for, the, um, for the COVID virus. But what my colleague has, t in relation to the COVID virus, COVID-19 virus, my colleague has unpublished data that is, in his, in his view, I'm not, a, I'm not a molecular biologist, so I can't, I can't attest to his work uh, in sort of its technical expertise, but what he tells me, is that um, the entire, from the U.S. samples, from the U.S. isolates, from the Chinese isolates of the COVID virus, from Iran, I think he's got some, they all have identical, essentially identical um, genes. I mean, there's no evolution has been. If, if a virus has been passed from person to person rapidly and briskly, that virus accumulates mutations, right? Okay. So if you get a, a, a if you get an isolate of the virus from the United States and then compare it with the Chinese virus, you should see changes. You should be able to say that this has been gone through so, so many different uh, individuals and so on. And that doesn't seem to be so, according to my colleague. And uh, I, I sort of tend to believe him, and uh, his ex his competence is. Is not questioned, uh, and so so there's there's a mystery there that a lot of the stuff that is being uh, studied seems to indicate that there was a single monoculture of uh, viral particles that um, fell over first of all over Wuhan uh, in a huge quantity over Wuhan, and then uh, it was carried in stratospheric winds and 
came down in various other places in the in the northern mostly in the northern hemisphere there's a belt of latitude between about 30 and 60 degrees where several different locations have been affected very badly like in Italy for instance in the Lombard valley uh, this is a mountain range just on the valley of a huge mountain range very tall mountains and then in Iran likewise and in, now in the United States, and they all fall in the same latitude belt. So, so whilst there is, of course, there is person-to-person -person spread, viruses are, are notorious in, in being able to spread across uh, populations, but uh, there is a more important uh, mechanism or mode of propagation that cannot be, should not be ignored, and which is it's essentially uh, the infall mechanism. Yeah. You've got to work that into the into the story. Otherwise, you're missing out some important um, features of the of the epidemic. And that's that's our view. Yeah, and you you also talked about a um, a, a recent impact or a fireball, basically in, Bolide, in yeah. or Bolide yeah. in China. Yeah, that was an interesting. It, it didn't. That wasn't necessary for a, a pandemic right. because. We were talking about small microscopic dust particles containing viruses. They can come in any time. They can come in with, even with the regular meteor showers. And we know that the the time of the uh, the onset of this uh, recent pandemic, it was during the Orionid meteor shower in November, oh, late late October, early November. Um, so they could come in in the smaller bits and pieces, but. As it turned out, there was a fireball event, a very, very conspicuous fireball event that was recorded, seen uh, in a place called Jilin, north of about a, nearly a thousand kilometers north of Wuhan. And uh, that fireball could possibly, I'm not saying it did, could have released uh, bits and pieces on its trajectory. And some of it might have... Uh, been dumped into the stratosphere in Wuhan, and then the stratospheric uh, currents could take it across the entire latitude belt from 40 to 60 across the whole world over a period of months. Hmm. So that's a possibility. <clears throat> but I mean, what, what I, really, I really think is in view of the, the, the discoveries that I mentioned of bacteria being actually found in the stratosphere and viruses being found to be falling up to four kilometers in on the mountain tops, is, isn't it high time that uh, some groups of really high-powered scientists took took it on themselves to monitor the uh, infall of uh, bacteria and viruses from above, right? And Absolutely. if you find and 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 go to the stratosphere would be best because if you find something in the stratosphere that is like uh, a COVID virus or influence, a new type of influenza virus, the time that it takes to fall to the ground from 40 kilometers could be up to a year. Right? Ah. If you go into rain clouds, it it will fall in, in days or weeks or something. But at 40, 50 kilometers, uh, the, the, the downfall is a very slow process and it could take, <clears throat> it could, certainly could take a couple of years to Reach ground. So, if you were to detect at at these great heights, if you can detect uh, pathogens in the advance of them falling on the earth, then that is a massive advantage for public health and for human health generally, because we have time to 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 devise or produce vaccines. We have time to make preparations as are needed, and so on. So that's. Uh, Something that I mean, I remember, I'm reminded of Arthur C. Clarke. My friend Arthur C. Clarke used to say that if the dinosaurs had a space guard program, <laughs> they're here now, right? <laughs> and that's the kind of program that we need. I and mean, if you really take seriously the possibility that that we are connected, biologically connected to the external universe, which I think the the case for that is very strong, you've got to also take the uh, further possibility very serious, serious to that occasionally viruses and, and bacteria that are pathogenic to humans that are disease causing would also be falling from the skies and if the 
infall can be monitored on a regular basis. And nowadays, I mean, the techniques are there. There are devices that are called, what are they called? Um, next generation gene sequencing techniques that you can essentially instantly sequence all of the genomes that are falling onto a sort of little writing pad sized uh, device. So you can put that up at 50 kilometers and then and then uh, uh, essentially transmit the data to the ground on a regular basis or con continually, then you'd know what's going on. If there's anything that is a sequence that is unusual or potentially dangerous, then, then the uh, protective measures can be can be taken. So right. all of these things are for the future, but I think it's important that uh, they, they should be considered. They shouldn't be regarded as being so outlandish, impossible, right. heretical, uh, what, what are the other words that they use? Pseudoscience. Pseudoscience, <laughs> yeah. of course, yeah. The guys yeah. who use the word pseudoscience don't know what pseudoscience means. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be very interesting to to do that experiment that you're talking about because the, you know not only the predictive aspect of it but we would be able to see you know perhaps there are times when these things are m more prevalent or uh you know and I, I know some of your work had to do with uh solar cycles. Yeah. yeah and we yeah. just so happen to be in a solar minimum at the moment. Deep solar minimum. Yeah, and deep solar minimum. So, so deep that um, I began to, I mean, uh, together, I mean, this is a Chinese colleague who really alerted me to this. To my, his name is Qiu Yu, pronounced Chu, I'm told. He's, and he's a, young, he's a young epidemiologist and a medical scientist in China, uh, not far from Wuhan, in fact. And see, so he's been uh, praising me of what's happening in Wuhan. But he, he is the guy who uh, essentially alerted me to the data that shows there's a huge in, in, input now of cosmic rays, high energy gamma rays, and they've got detecting stations in various mountain tops and so on. So there's there's a lot of lot of hard radiation coming down to the earth. The hard radiation could do two things. One, it could uh, it could uh, affect the viruses that are already on the ground. It could cause mutations and and do things on the ground and. Uh, uh, at, to pre-existing viruses. But what I found most interesting is that during a very deep solar minimum, the the sun is not pushing out electrons as vigorously as it normally does, right? And you need that outflow of fast electrons out from the sun in order to uh, maintain an electri magnetic field that protects the Earth from charged particles, because if we have a charged particle, a magnetic field, the charged particle gyrates around the magnetic field, the magnetic field essentially directs its path. And so the, it's, a, it's like a protective shield uh, to, for the Earth to, to be protected, to be essentially protected from the hardest, most energetic of cosmic rays. And that has been lifted for the past year and a half with the deepest solar minimum. There are many days in which there are no sunspots to be seen at all uh, in the last right. two months. So we've got a very exceptional uh, solar situation. And so we alerted the, we wrote a paper with all these guys saying that this is the time that you should really be vigilant because it's uh, an open access to, to charged particles from space. Hmm. That's very interesting too. It reminds me that the, the uh, Many ancient peoples uh, have had traditions about, you know, dealing with a dying sun or something like that. You know, they were trying to that, hold off the uh, the death of their son because yes. it caused all kinds of mayhem. And yeah, uh, it's just I don't know an interesting connection to that. I think so. I think so. I mean, sunspots have been looked at for. I mean, the ancient the Chinese certainly kept a watch on, uh, kept a record of sunspots. I mean, they were the, by far the most avid and accurate observers of the of the skies, isn't it, before the Europeans uh, started their work in the, uh, just after the Enlightenment. Until then, they, they also sort of turned away from the skies. They didn't, the, the, the great supernova that caused it, the, the Crab Nebula was not recorded by any European scientists. 
And mm-hmm. that's a very interesting story because uh, the, the reigning dogma, reign, reigning theology in the West was that the skies could not change. So if you have a star, new star, that's not possible. If you have an exploding star, that's not that was not possible in the 13th, 14th century. So it just didn't get recorded. Whereas in China, you had all the records of uh, of supernovae, novae, comets, and there was no such records kept in in, in Europe for reasons of of theology and ideology. So we have a similar situation now, I think, from the point of view of scientific ideology, we tend to turn away from unpalatable <clears throat> facts that we don't uh, like to uh, to think about. Right. So it and again, talking about COVID-19, you have pointed out in some recent publications, uh, I've, I was reading them on the Cosmic Tusk, George Howard's website. Uh, he's posted yeah. some of your stuff. Where you guys are discussing the, where there it's it's been difficult for people to explain, uh, how, uh, how multiple infections took place all at once, and there's no epidemiological connection between these people that got you know, or they can't find it at least, and so the the people are making yeah. making the assumption that it must be there, but it can't be found, but. But your team is is saying, well, you know, maybe it's coming down from the sky. And you also point to what you were talking about before, that there is like zero mutation shown, which seems like a pure yeah. infection, right, from a pure source. Yeah, it looks like that. I mean, the, 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 the search for case one or case zero in many places has turned out to be uh, a very difficult one. And they, they end up inventing something or, or having a far-fetched uh, explanation of someone who might have come from China met some people. I mean, this, one of the, uh, this, this is an interesting uh, thought experiment, right? If the, in, I think, that I do think that the COVID is infectious and we, we have probably d- to doing the right thing in trying to enforce some kind of measures of s- distancing. I'm not entirely sure that the rigidity of these measures is needed, uh, but uh, it is infectious to some extent, at least, right? Right. But um, the if the infection is the only and the most powerful way of transmission, there is one natural experiment that now has uh, come to be really quite uh, a high power, a high profile experiment, which is that uh, the heir to the throne of uh, the United Kingdom and the British Empire, Prince Charles. Has, has succumbed to it, right? Right. And in, in the previous week, apparently, we are told that he, he would have seen at least 3,000 people. Uh, he, had a, he, had a, he had a banquet in which he entertained lots of people. Then I think he, he gave medals to lots of people. He met uh, uh, young people of various... Um, he, he, he met lots of people. And likewise, uh, maybe our prime minister also was is supposed to be positive, and he must have surely met lots of the people. I, I, I think that would be a natural experiment to, uh, if anything happens, then, I mean, looking for the transmissions are always have always turned out to be different, difficult, isn't it? Yes. Who trans, who transmitted to whom? Um, it certainly is trans. A virus is transmissible because it's an infective agent. If, uh, if if you inject a virus, uh, you know, the COVID virus into a person's uh, respiratory tract, he obviously the chances are that he would get the virus. So there's there's no dispute about that. But is that the main main mode of spread in certain places, like in Italy, for instance? That's right. question. And it is interesting. Also, one of the papers that you guys had published, mm-hmm. you show this 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 uh, the band the latitude. Uh, and across that, you see all the worst infection cases. Yeah, and yeah. you were arguing that 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 weren't you saying that there is a stratospheric wind or something that can explain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's the main. Uh, uh, the Earth rotates around the axis around its axis, and then the latitudinal distribution is is determined by the winds that blow. Essentially, the winds are always. Uh, Meridian, uh, along merit, meridians around latitude belts. 
Right. It's a strong, strong wind. So if you dump anything on the uh, in a northern latitude, latitude of 40 degrees, you tend to be spreading it selectively around, along the same latitude around the world. Right. So if we had some kind of early warning system, like you were talking about, where they could, I mean, how, how would that work? It, wouldn't that, uh, I, I, I would imagine that would take a lot of work if there's as many viruses as you say raining down on us you know, every day in yeah. one meter. I think the, the, new, the new techniques of what's called uh, in situ, it's called the next generation gene sequencing. So you have a device that essentially tells you the whole range of its text, all the DNA of all the bits and pieces that you are sampling. And so you can separate the viruses, you can separate the bacteria, and you, well, you must need a high-powered computer to do it. Right. To, to, them as well, but you, you the theories. I'm not, I don't know much about these the technical details, but I was told by my colleagues that this te technology is in place. It exists and can be can be deployed, and it's not that expensive. Ah, right. That's 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 the key to it. That uh, really should be stressed. For example, now I have a project that is being funded by groups in the UK. Uh, and in the in Japan, to uh, send a balloon up to 50 kilometers over central Sri Lanka, <clears throat> and with the with this new generation uh, gene sequencing also, and the whole operation, the funding for that whole operation is 15,000 US dollars. Oh, Can you believe? Wow. 15,000 US dollars, which is nothing. It's peanuts. Isn't yeah. It? That's nothing. It's like, yeah, and uh, I mean, the, the, there's no labor cost in Syria. It's a, it's, 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 that's the cost of the material that is needed. So on top of that, there's some labor cost and so on. But it's it's a trivial cost to maintain some kind of tracking device, tracking system where you can, uh, on an, in a real time basis, determine what how innocuous the microbial flora is up at. Uh, 50, 60 kilometers as high as you like to go and then and then have some alerts if the microbial flora is not uh, is not very good. Right, if it's dangerous it can, yeah. we can be alerted. You can be alerted and then you can take the appropriate measures. So, I mean, that may be pie in the sky at the moment and I mean, for me it's pie in the sky because I can't do it but <laughs> I'm told that <laughs> I'm told that the techniques, the techniques are there, and surely in 2020, with all of the really high-powered uh, biotech uh, possibilities and computer possibilities and so on, this this must be should be considered as a feasible option at least to explore. Right. I think it, it sounds like a great idea to me. I, I believe we ought to be watching. We, we ought to have a much better system for looking for actual impactors. Yeah, and, I think so. And, yeah. and we ought to have a good system for looking for, you know, these kinds of things raining down on us from space, especially when in some cases it can cause uh, so many deaths and so many problems. Yeah, yeah. Near Earth, near Earth objects, I think we've recovered. We, we, we've done a little bit on that right. since the alerts were made by so many people in the last uh, 20 years, isn't it? There are, there are networks of telescopes that are searching for near Earth objects and, and mapping the orbits and so on. So if there's a, a huge bolloid that is threatening to hit us in the next 10 years, we'll probably be able to do something about it. Right. The other thing I wanted to, to point out um, is that this may, interestingly, this may be connected to Halley's Comet. Isn't that right? Like, if, if this is what's yeah, happening? It's tantalizingly close to the Orionid stream. Right. I mean, the Earth, every October, November, late October, early November, intercepts the, the stream of particles, team of debris that comes, came out of Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet has a, uh, was last, what is it, was uh, 1986 was the last... Uh, perihelion passage, and it's got a 76-odd year period around the sun, and it's been around many times around the sun. So it has got, it's in, in the course of its passage around the sun, oh, perihelion, many perihelion passages, it's thrown out a lot of debris of different sizes. Bits of the comet would have broken loose. There would have been, there would have been, there would be dust particles, there would be pebbles, there would be 
there'll be part of, there'll be fragments of the comet and so on. And they've all be following a loop around the, the sun with the same essentially with the same period as the comet itself, isn't it? And that's what's going to that's why the Orionids come at the same time every year. Right. So uh, what's an interesting coincidence is that this uh, November, October, November event coincides with the Earth crossing the Orionid stream. And so it, when, when it's, there's a temptation, there's a, at least a hint right. that it might be part of the Orionid. It need not be. It could be just sort of random into the interplanetary dust that carried this virus. It uh, right. landed to a particular spot in uh, at 40 degree latitude and then got carried around the Earth. Right, but just like just like impacts, I mean, there are there is a cyclical nature to these things out out in the cosmos, but there can be yeah. random, you know. Uh, yeah, it's a combination well. of random events and cycl and the cyclical events. Cyclic, so the cyclic events are connected mostly in a, for the Earth are connected with uh, the orbit of the Earth around the Sun and the orbits of comets around the Sun, isn't right. it? And they are periodic, and there's no question about comets being per have periods and yep. <clears throat> so and many of these, is, as well as the solar cycle is is uh, periodic. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everything in space is a giant circles. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I, I start to, I've started to think that even if it looks like a, a one off, it's just part of a really big circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice way of putting it because we, we I think that's that's the way it seems to be. I Whenever mean, you think it's a single event then there's been a succession of events that uh, sort of follows the same pattern, isn't it? Right. Okay, so t can you tell us about the concept of the, the, the cosmic octopus? Uh, oh, well, I don't know. I think what I, that, that made big news because we wrote a paper called The Cambrian Explosion. And what we said was that most of the huge uh, surges of evolution have been the result of, uh, of genetic material that has been suddenly dumped into the earth, right? And effected. Right. And then. Just, uh, spliced into the genomes of evolving uh, pre-existing life forms that are already evolving on the Earth. That seems to be happening, uh, ha that seems to have happened regularly throughout the period of the evolution of life on, on, on the Earth. The sudden emergence of, uh, of uh, eukaryotes, the sudden emergence of multicellular life, sudden uh, explosion of multicellular life, and so on. So all of these are, are events that uh, happened, uh, discrete events that happened, and it's almost certain that uh, it didn't happen independently, in, individually on the Earth, separate from the rest of the cosmos. There was a continuing interaction taking place between the Earth and the external, what I like to call the cosmic biosphere, and the cosmic biosphere introduces these... Uh, these new genetic possibilities that get spliced into the evolution of life. So the uh, the ancestor of the octopus is the squid, is a humble squid, right? And the transition from the squid to the octopus happened very quickly, as far as we can say, in terms of the geological record. And so the the idea that we had was that the um, that this was a a genetic program that was totally alien to the Earth and came and got implanted on the Earth at the time, just after the Cambrian, ex Cambrian explosion. I mean, that's a that's a hypothesis. The, for simply fits. It's not proven by any means, but right. it's, uh, it fits the uh, the missing gap between uh, the squid and the octopus because there's almost a universe apart. I mean, they, they, they sort of follow the same general biological patterns in a very general sort of way, but the intelligence of the octopus, the, the different uh, mechanisms for um, camouflage and, 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 and most of the intelligence, it's an incredibly intelligent creature, isn't it? The, yes. The octopus. Yeah, they are, they are incredibly intelligent. And so, so the yeah. idea that this happened 
because of an injection of information, basically biological yeah. information from the greater, as you call it, the cosmic biosphere is yeah. absolutely fascinating. That is absolutely fascinating. And yeah, I, other, other, as you go to say that it happened randomly, just a r remote possibility that it happened on the earth against all the odds. And I, I, I just refuse to accept that things happen against against such tremendous odds. I think there has to be uh, powerful reasons to make that statement. If the other the other possibility is that this is a, a result of evolution on a cosmic scale over cosmic time scales, and the whole package of of evolution, a completed genome essentially or body plan of the octopus was already there in the universe and uh, and was implanted on onto our planet um, at some moment in time and came with uh, comets and so on that's that's the that's the possibility that is um, regarded as being a bit heretical but it's not at all it's not at all impossible or even implausible i, I think as long it's accept that the evolution life of evolution of life is a truly cosmic process, a process that can only be understood at a cosmic level. Right. That's that's the part of the whole concept that fascinates me because, you know, I mean, we've talked about the idea of panspermia or even, you know, in some cases directed panspermia on this podcast. Yeah. We've talked about that many times. But what you're yeah. actually, I think, you know, from looking at your work and listening to you on other interviews and I'm getting the idea that what you're saying is is that that the, that the idea really is, is that this evolution is taking place on a universe-wide scale, and that's why it's possible. Uh, whereas if you try to confine it to a single planet, it becomes incredibly very improbable. difficult to explain. It's very difficult. I think you've got to then uh, make assumptions of extremely improbable events that took place against all the odds and uh, in a very short time scale. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's what people do, and then they, <laughs> they think that 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 has to be the only explanation because we are disconnected from the rest of the universe. But if we accept that we are connected to the much bigger universe, the universe offers many, many, many more possibilities than our minuscule little speck of dust in the cosmic context, isn't it? That's that's the key to it. Right. I think on the Earth. We have a extremely minute, minutest possible time span, the minutest possible uh, volume of space in which we do any, everything, and we can't do everything there. And so, this is um, the alternative: is that the the most uh, the biggest inventions happen on the biggest scale. Right. So, I I, I want to ask I want to ask a question that's you know this is this is a obviously it's. You can't know this, but I want to ask you: What is your, what is your picture? What what do you think is the most likely scenario for life starting somewhere? Do you think it did possibly get started in one place, or do you think that this is a wider phenomena? Did it take place in multiple places, or is there a single uh, uh, starting point? I guess is what I'm getting yeah. at. Well, I don't know. I, th I think I've got to I, I've got to really. Uh, Try to avoid. Then I've always tried to avoid that question because ah. I think what what I would uh, see from the data itself is that you've got to push it further and further back in time, and then you've got to say that it happened with the universe itself. And then the question is: Is is the Big Bang universe the Big Bang event, the beginning of everything? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think it was. It sort of ties in with uh, the deepest of cosmological questions that. I think people think, cosmologists think they have the final answers. But again, I think in relation to the big cosmological questions, the the answers are far from final. Yeah. Oh, that's a very excellent dodge. That's yeah, I think, I think that's, I honestly, I think <laughs> that's, that's a very, good. I think it's that's a matter. wise position, though, because yeah. really uh, the the important thing is we're, we're trying to study what's going on here on Earth and in the cosmos. And we are, we're interested yeah. in life. We want to know where did it come yeah. from. But yeah. the question of whether it came from Earth or it began out in the cosmos is very important to that ultimate discovery of how life began. So, I think so. I think so. And also, to, if, if it is a truly cosmic phenomenon, if it is part and parcel, if the whole of life is part of the, the structure of the universe itself, it's almost uh, 
it has a similar status as uh, as the laws of physics, isn't it? Yes. Basically. Yes. Hmm. That that is a fascinating concept right there. <laughs> uh, it's fundamental, right? It's uh, fundamental. Yes. It's fundamental. And uh, I don't I don't really for a moment believe that. I mean, if you go back uh, not so long ago, people thought that the the Earth was uh, was carried on the or what's on the back of a turtle, and the turtle was swimming in a in an infinite sea, and so on. And so many different uh, right. cosmological models have been thrashed through the history of uh, civilization, isn't it? And to and science has in, has come in into play in the last uh, hundred years, but I don't think we have the final answers by any means. As to, uh, in regard to these these really fundamental questions of how where life began, how the universe began. But, uh, but, yeah, but if, if, life if, didn't begin on the Earth, for sure. Right. And if, if life is fundamental in the same way that the you know, physical constants seem to be, uh, but, that, it, that, that, re, that is a, an entire reorganizing of people's idea about the universe itself, which is also very fascinating. Yeah, I think so. I think it has to be something along those lines. Uh, if, if you say it happened in our galaxy as a collective uh, venture connecting all the sort of potential sites for origin, if they all act collectively, then you gain some advice. I mean, the, improb the point is that the improbabilities of starting, improbability of starting life from non-life is on such a super astronomical scale that you cannot really overcome it unless you go to the beginning of the universe itself. You've got to go mm. back to to ask the question, how is it that the universe got started? And that's connected with how life got started. <laughs> that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think you just blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's, that's my personal point of view. But I don't think, I don't think you can look at, you can localize it in any uh, any rec recognizable recognizable cosmic structure like a planet uh, or or a solar system or a planetary system, I think any of those things are far too small. You need the biggest available um, probability space, as if you like to call it, to overcome this super astronomical improbability. Right. Well, I just have to say, from my personal perspective. Uh, the octopus looks like it comes from space. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, I think so. I think it looks very, very, and, <laughs> and it is so apparently. I mean, it is so exceedingly intelligent in the way that it uh, deals with its environment and so on, isn't it? And it's not. It's its lighting system. Its fluorescent yeah. lighting system. It's uh, chromophores that do all sorts of bizarre things. Right. I mean, they're so good at camouflage. How would we know that they're not in space? You can't see them. You can't, you can't see them. <laughs> yeah. We got one another question here. Uh, yeah, so uh, George is saying we should ask you about Sir Fred Hoyle. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, he's a fantastic person, my reckoning. I think he's one of the, he's the iconic astronomer of the... 20th century. I can't really compare him with anyone else because he his interests straddled the whole of astronomy. Uh, there's no area of astronomy that he hadn't uh, touched on and embellished in one way or another. Uh, he's best known, of course, for his uh, theory of nuclear synthesis, how the chemical elements uh, got together. But uh, after he started collaborating with me in the 1970s, uh, he had essentially decided that this was the most important part of his entire scientific career. In fact, in an unpublished essay that is in his archive, he reviews his own career and he says that his collaboration with me was, was by far the most important in the whole of his uh, uh, career in science. Well, wow. how long did you guys work together? Uh, I started off as a student. I came to Cambridge as his research student in 1960, and we spent uh, spent three years with him doing my PhD, and then 
uh, the next uh, five or six years in Cambridge, uh, as he's uh, collaborating with him on various projects and so on. And then when I got my professorship in Cardiff, uh, he had retired then from his Cambridge uh, uh, job, he became his Cambridge chair, and he became an uh, honorary professor at the same university as I did, uh, um, the, in Cardiff. He didn't, of course, move to Cardiff. He, he lived in the Lake District, which he loved, and he, we used to co do most of our correspondence, communications, uh, by a process that you've forgotten now, called the fax machine. Wow. <laughs> uh, there was no a, internet. It's an no ancient internet. artifact. I've heard of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the telephone and the fax machine were the, were the uh, sort of lines of, co of communication that... Uh, and then, of course, we had meetings occasionally. He used to come to Cardiff, spend uh, days with me and so on, and write papers together and stuff like that. But we've written dozens and dozens of papers and collaborated over the almost the whole of his or half his life. Wow. Well, I, I have to say this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Uh, I'd love to have you on again at some point, maybe to continue as we, we talk about these kinds of subjects quite often on this podcast. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Oh, we'd love to. I'd love to. I hope my wife was okay because I got a sore throat and I was sort of really, uh, my wife's voice was going a little bit funny, but uh, it came across okay, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, you sir. sounded great. Yeah. So can you, why don't you tell people where they can find more about you and your work? Oh, that's a difficult question. I don't know. I haven't been really very active in publicity as uh, George probably knows. George has done more publicity for me in the last last two or three weeks than anyone else. Ah. <laughs> Visit the Cosmic Tusk. Well, there you go. Visit yeah. Cosmic Tusk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the websites of the university that I'm linked in, Sri Lanka, maybe Ruhuna University, has a site that they're updating and putting publications and so on. Well, just give the us your of, fax number. <laughs> well, fax number is okay, yeah. Uh, well, I don't have a fax number. <laughs> I've, got rid, I've got rid of the machine, machine a long time ago. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. And yes. uh, I have to say, we, we all want to say thanks uh, so much to George Howard for setting this up. Yes. Uh, we had a great time talking to you, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. That was our interview with Dr. Chandra Wickramasinghe. And so it was interesting. We had the watcher on with us and George Howard. George Howard was there to, to listen. So he was giving us questions and the watcher was giving us input. But as always, what happened is, is once we're done with the show, we stop recording and we keep talking. George comes on and we're talking about stuff. And then we got such good, such great content afterwards that Kyle hit the record again because we're just like, man, this is fantastic. So we've taken some excerpts from the post-show discussion with George uh, and Dr. Chandra, and we want to play some of those for you now. So yeah. here we go. I think that the the case for a infall combined with uh, transmission is what we really should go for. To ignore the infall is uh, to our peril. I think if it is an important process, I think the infall is an important primary process of uh, how the virus got to to the earth. And if we ignore the the subsequent features of the infall, then I think we're missing out something, and we might be jeopardizing even the the way that we cope with the with the pandemic, and so I think it's it's important to to keep in mind all these possibilities, and certainly not to rule out the infall hypothesis on the grounds that it's, it is either pseudoscience or implausible or some silly, idiotic reasons that are offered for which has no which have no basis in any factual situation whatsoever. Well, I think that there's bound to be a multitude of worlds that are inhabited. And if, I mean, if, if we, are, we are really getting a very small sampling of the, all the possibilities of the cosmic gene ensemble 
coming together in different ways. Wow. We found in, on the earth, we've got a huge variety uh, of life forms and so on. We think it's marvelous, and I'm sure that's that this is just a, the tip of the iceberg. There must be a huge variety, a big, much bigger variety of life, and um, uh, is greater there... levels, higher levels of intelligence. I cannot for a moment believe that human beings r represent the absolute peak of the development of intelligence in, yeah. uh, in animals. That, that's in a very arrogant position to, to maintain. So there must be creatures who are 10 times more intelligent than us, 100 times, maybe 1,000 times more intelligent than us. And so these, uh, this has to be considered. If you, if, you really think, if you really accept the idea that life is a truly cosmic phenomenon, then you've got to, uh, to keep all these options open. I think there's no way in which you can exclude the possibility of intelligent life existing on a truly colossal scale in the universe. That's right. cool. Chandra is one of those uh, forms of life that's a hundred times more intelligent than we are. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're very kind. You're too kind. <laughs> Another thing that would be fascinating is in, in some of these really harsh worlds, like I, I read a story a couple of weeks ago about this exoplanet that they found that rains uh, metal, molten yeah. metal every, every on its dark side and Yes, it yes. has clouds of metal on it. If there were extremophiles that could live in conditions like that, like an entire species of extremophiles, right? Yeah, Not just yeah. the bacteria and the viruses, but yeah, yeah, that, macro organisms. Macro organisms. Yeah. That would be insane. Yeah, yeah. there could be It'll giant be exactly. whales swimming around in the gases of Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. All we yeah. Know. But from our experience on the Earth. In every every possible niche, no matter how hostile you think it is, there's always a microorganism or an organism that has taken uh, refuge there, isn't it? And yeah. taken advantage of the local conditions. So, uh, inhospitable is a very subjective uh, yes, description. Yes, a good point. Of an environment. Right. As long as there's energy, something can yeah. live there and consume it. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it had better be below the melt. Uh, temperature had better be below the melting point of uh, uh, <laughs> carbon. Oh, carbon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> point. Good point. Yeah. yeah. But the other fascinating idea about this that 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 the the biome uh, you know is cosmic that 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 life. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I, I, I was collaborated with an America with a. Uh, Los Angeles doctor two years ago, and he was very keen on saying that the microbiome is a changing, has a changing pattern, and lots of the lots of the uh, dispositions of illness, the patterns of illness that are being uh, seen around the world is due to a, the changing microbiome. And the microbiome, if it's cosmic, is naturally changing. It's not all, always the same. There's right. going to be uh, almost continual changes of it. So we are responding as humans and cows and animals and so on. We have a microbiome that is um, in a state of constant flux. Isn't right. It? Yeah. And the, the other thing that I thought was, I thought of, I, I didn't say this on the show, but when I asked you about, you know, how would these things survive in deep space? Well, there's diatoms and they build little crystal shells around themselves. I wonder if, yeah. I wonder if that, you know, in some cases, the, those diatoms could build shells around themselves that would protect them from hard radiation. Absolutely. I think diatoms are very, very hard structures. Yeah. And we found diatoms, I, I, I didn't mention this, in a, in a meteorite fall in Sri Lanka in 2013, there was a, a fireball scene in central Sri Lanka, uh, and a paddy field was just splattered with little bits of uh, porous rubble, it looked like porous rubble, the following morning. And so the farmer went and took these to, and he was quite frightened. He took them to various places, to universities, to medical research centers, and so on. And eventually, we got some, I got samples of it sent to me. Ah. And uh, we had it analyzed over about two or three years. We had a program from 2013 to about 2015. Uh, there was also an American guy called Richard Hoover who was involved in this. And we found uh, diatoms, very recently living diatoms, but not contaminated, can, not contaminants from the earth, but they were in some environment where they have been recently living. 
So these were found there. And uh, the unfortunate situation for this meteorite is called the Polonaro meteorite. We tried to get it uh, approved as a meteorite by the American Meteoritic Society, and they reckon that because we didn't have video footage what? and uh, attestation by it was a couple of farmers, poor farmers, subsistence farmers, who had seen it and who had produced these uh, these rocks and so on. And we were able to go there and we collected the rocks for themselves, but that wasn't good enough. They had to have uh, photographs from the sky or something, and so it's still not classified as a meteorite, but ah. it's, uh, it's an amazing fall of stuff. We, we have a mixture of... Uh, of uh, acritarchs, which are extinct organisms that were extinct on the Earth, and, and so on. It's very, very... That's why they wouldn't let you classify it as a meteorite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of something else, going back to the coronavirus situation. It would be really interesting, after all of this is over, uh, to check out some of these uncontacted tribes down in the Amazon and see, I mean, I know we, we, we don't even make contact, so it would be difficult, yeah. but it would yeah. be interesting to know uh, what's going on with them and if they had any, any effects from this. Yeah, but you know what, what surprises me, uh, I mean, it still surprises me and the colleagues that I've been working with, why is it that if it is an infection, as, as in, if infection is the only mode of transmission of this virus, right? Uh, people from China have been going to India, to South Africa, and so on. It didn't explode anywhere there. Right. In, yeah, it's strange. In, there, there are 10 cases. In India, there are supposed to be, I don't know, 100 cases. And if, if you've ever been to India, you know, it's such a congested uh, place. Right. That, it seems uh, like it should spread like wildfire there, if that is the main... You should have hundreds of people dying of it, or thousands of people. Yeah. And yet there are only a handful of cases compared with uh, England and Germany and yeah. so on. And this, so is something to this is totally anecdotal, but I have been very suspicious that this virus was actually around here where we live in Texas and in, in the rest of the United States for quite some time, just as long as it we've been getting the reports from China. Yes. Because yes. a lot of people that we're friends with got sick and they thought they had the flu. Um, yeah. they, they weathered the storm or something and it sort of went away, but then it relapsed. Yeah. And yeah. Was, yeah. some of them went and got tested and it came up negative. For the flu. For the yeah. flu. Uh, this yeah. was before the whole corona. You know, And now we're looking back and I've talked to multiple of these people about it. And, and I'm like, go, go on YouTube and look watch videos of people describing their symptoms and they're coming back saying, wow, yeah, yeah. that's that's have, what I have. have. Sure, yeah, I'm sure I have, I have probably am with several of the people around me. We must have had subclinical attacks of it and uh, it not been noticed. Yeah. Yeah, and this was back in, you know, December, early yeah. January. I mean, right, right when we were first seeing these stories coming out of China. Yeah. Um, guys, I'm, I'm as non hypochondriac as you can get, right? I generally have no concern for my health and don't pay attention to it, which is not good. But <laughs> yeah. I'm convinced I caught that shit in New Orleans, man. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I bet you did. For four days, I got home. We got home on Thursday. On Saturday, yeah. I did a Peloton, like 30 minutes on the exercise bike. Felt great at 11 o'clock. I called yeah. for the first time at 3. By yeah. six o'clock, I was dry coughing. I've never had a cough like that. You, you've been, you, you've been hit. Yep. Coughed my way through the night. Woke up the next day. Yeah. Did not end up with a head cold. Where usually what usually happens to me, and then it died off within about another twenty four hours. Skipped yeah. work on Monday out of an abundance of caution. Came to work on Tuesday and got three people sick. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah got sick but i i just do think that it's spread a lot you know well at least that's a place that's known to spread i probably yeah yeah, yeah yeah i'm sure that's true yeah it must be there must be a huge number of people who have been subclinically affected and uh, and you're probably quite immune now you go you could go to the middle of china and right come, yeah come safe i need to get on the front lines now <laughs> yeah yeah <clears throat> well you, thank you thank you so much enough. Another very interesting thing that I couldn't—I didn't get a chance of telling you. I, 
discovered a couple of weeks ago that uh, at this almost at the same time as the uh, the COVID outbreak took place in China, the the all of the Chinese uh, pig farms reported what they what they called swine fever, and they lost sixty percent yes. of livestock. You heard that, right? Yes, no, I did. I yeah, they, yeah. They, they killed so many pigs because of this. Yeah, they were wiping them out. Yeah, yeah. They, they found it in pigs and the, the pigs were dying and so on. Yep. And it was at the same time as the, uh, as the coronavirus outbreak. So it's a, the coincidence in timing is amazing. Yes. It must have come with the, from the same uh, source, basically. Yep. And yeah. And going back to the... A different okay. virus that got the pigs or what? Yeah, well, I don't know. I think they might be. I think what came down was probably a cocktail of viruses, and the virus that affected the the pig is not not the same as the coronavirus, but it's a it's a RNA virus. It's a, it's called a swine fever virus. Gotcha. And uh, and and millions or billions. I don't know how many millions, but the the entire pig population was decimated. Yeah, I'm reading about it now. Oh. Yeah. It would be very interesting, uh, interesting case study to go back and look in correlation with the solar cycles. I mean, r literally yeah. just within the last month, because we report on we, we do a, a quick uh, yeah. what we call space weather news report at the beginning yeah. of every podcast. Yeah. And we've yeah. been talking about the solar minimum, the solar minimum. And then finally, we had one sunspot that had the reverse polarity. Yeah, and it's okay. just the the sun is it's just showing signs now that its magnetic polarity is flipping. It's flipping, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, that's... and then, bam, coronavirus, yeah. this this yeah. virus with the yeah. pigs and all. That. It, so it'd be interesting to know from observations that moment when we first start seeing those uh, reverse polarity. You know, is that the, is this yeah, around that's... the time? You know, where where there are other pandemics, it, whether they yeah. were in the animal kingdom or or with yeah. humans or what? That would be very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah some, something else that they have, the, the, the sun's uh, solar cycle is intimately connected with all these. And well, some, some things that I heard from a, a correspondent who read some of these papers and so on, wrote to me and showed uh, a correlation with the, that's called a wolf minimum of the solar cycle, which is a very deep minimum in the 15th, is it the 15th century or 14th, 15th century, right? Yeah, I think... And, and if you look at the... If you can check at the internet, the um, cattle across the whole of Europe, Asia, uh, America, and so on, died in a matter of months. Uh, this is coinciding like, with what they call the Little Ice Age? The Maunder Minimum. Maunder Minimum? Yeah, I mean, the, well, yeah, I think so. Something somewhere at the 15th century or 14th, 15th century. Yeah. Wow. Mm. So, so, the cycle, so the cycle seems to have had an effect all, all through history, isn't it? 1645, maybe, was the Maunder minimum? Yeah. Wolf minimum is what the guy wolf. said. Oh, that, wolf minimum. Wolf. When was that? 14th or 15th century? I'll look it up. It's a wolf minimum. I yeah. can, I can, send, I can I'll send George, I got George's email. I'll send you the, the link of that paper that... Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, this is the same one. It's the Wolf Minimum, Grand Solar Minimum, uh, 1645 and 1715. Yeah, yeah. And that is also called the Little Ice Age as well. Yeah. Man, that's really interesting stuff, man. This is this is right up our alley. We yeah. love this stuff. We love our listeners are going to love this show. Yeah. <laughs> do, you think, do you think they're going to love it? Oh, my God. Oh, they yeah. are going to be flipping out in the chats. I can tell you that. Yeah, they're going to love it. And I've also uh, Dr. Chandra, I've been I've been recording this yeah. whole time. So even after we ended the show, but I'm still recording. And there are some things in this last part that just are conversation here at the end that I, I might want to take some excerpts from. Yeah, Is that but, okay with you? Yeah, most certainly, yeah. I think, I think the, 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 the really important thing is to get a, a true understanding of what's going on during pandemics that are real live pandemics happening now. We don't get a chance of doing that in historical pandemics, isn't it? We just read about it and yeah. we make uh, guesses and inferences, but now we have the chance of really looking at uh, things in detail. For instance, the connection between this swine fever 
and the current uh, pandemic is very, very, I think, very interesting. Yeah, and I, I also think it's, uh, you know, I've been thinking about this, your, your idea of if we could have an early warning system. I mean, it would be great if the gene sequencing that's happening up there could alert us to stuff. But, I mean, we would want to know, uh, Kyle and I are farming, so we would want to know, like, is there going to be a virus that will affect cattle is there going to be a virus that will affect crops or will it affect Absolutely. Will, Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know like there are sometimes and we've seen this just where you know a certain kind of bug disappears and something that it used to eat comes in and decimates crops so like you yeah. know like yeah. it would be interesting to to have early warning for all of that like these viruses bees, yeah bees have gone out of completely sometime in oh, the past yeah. yeah five years ago there was a Huge decimation of bees across the whole world. Yes. I yeah. don't know what that was supposed to be caused by a virus or what, but nobody really... Nobody knows. Yeah. yeah. That's nobody right. knows what it is. Because uh, we, we also um, keep bees. And yeah. the, the, we've, we've lost quite a few hives, and there's a yeah. lot of talk amongst the beekeeper community. And they, yeah. they have this name for it. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but it, it's... Yeah, but it no, happened all across the whole world. Yeah. It happened... Yeah, and nobody has any idea why or what's going on. It's really strange. No, no, no. but many of these things have been totally unexplained, and and just they just remain so because people don't want to to accept that there is a, a connectivity across the world, isn't it? And that's that's a problem, and a connectivity with the external universe. I think that's that's the real problem that we face now. We really think of ourselves as as superior beings living on a planet that is disconnected from the rest of the cosmos. And and we do that to our peril. Right. And the real truth is that we are ruled by viruses from space. We are ruled, we are <laughs> intimately connected with the universe, not only physically, right. but biologically as well. Yeah. I mean, we think of the microbiome as being a connection between the external microbial environment and larger creatures like you and me and cows and so on and dogs. But um, the connection to the microbiota of the bigger universe is even more important to recognize and to accept because that's where the the bulk of the sort of untapped information lies. Yes. The information that could cause, could, could cause uh, diseases on the one hand and could lead to evolutionary progress, huge leaps of evolution maybe uh, lie in, in store there. And uh, I think we need to accept all these possibilities and they just uh, stem from the connection that we are trying to, to essentially rule out of existence. The connection right. is there. There's no doubt about it. We are connected to the bigger universe and uh, we have to come to grips with it in every possible way. Right. And the other the other cool thing, this just occurred to me, the other cool thing that this if this could become accepted, that there is a universal biome uh, and that that connects us, you know, maybe that connects us with the wider universe in terms of life, then we can look within ourselves to learn about life out in the universe. That's right. Because we have pieces of it in us. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. We're part of the cosmic microbiome. Yeah. Yeah. You can reverse engineer a lot of what's out there by looking at our pieces and parts. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's no question about that. As long as we, as soon as we get the correct message and we accept that we are part of a connected biosphere, then I think uh, we have a huge, very, very bright future ahead of us. If you don't, I think there's disaster. Yep. It's very difficult to change the paradigm, though, as we've seen with, uh, you know, a lot of, like the the uh, Younger yeah, Dryas Impact Hypothesis, uh, the, the Comet Research Group, uh, a lot of the, yeah. I mean, you know, and all through history, these paradigm shifts are fought yeah. <laughs> yeah. very hard. Yeah. Yeah, they fought very hard, but when it comes to a paradigm that has immediate uh, consequences to our daily existence, to our daily lives, I think, and... To our even to our well-being, maybe there is a chance that uh, yeah. we could switch. I yeah. absolutely believe in the chance for sure, yeah. Um, yeah. and and we'll do our part. We our little okay. tiny part over here. <laughs> that, that, well, that's right. I've been I've been reading up on Nicholas Copernicus, and if you're Copernicus, Chandra, then I'm George Joachim Redicus. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was the guy. He was the guy who popularized him and said, "Look, you gotta get this out there." <laughs> George, all you gotta say is, "Your team Redicus." I'll be your Redicus. I think I think your your website says it all. Yeah. <laughs> Cosmic <laughs> Tusk. Cosmic <laughs> Tusk. Yeah. Dig and dig. <laughs> All right, guys, this has been a, l- a lot of fun. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. All right. And there it is. Those were, it was just too fascinating to to not include the, yeah. the, the after show discussion there. <clears throat> so blowing stuff. Yeah. All right, you guys can get a hold of us, brothers of, brothers of the Serpent at gmail.com. Go to the website, brothers of the Serpent.com. Check out the Encyclopedia and the Glossary and the Snake Skins. Join the Patreon scheme through, or the, the <laughs> wow. Join the Pyramid scheme through Patreon or give us one time donation through PayPal. Give us reviews, especially Thanks to everybody on the. Everybody who has. Yes, done thank that. you guys so much. Uh, give us reviews on the iTunes uh, store, the Apple Podcasts. That really helps. And share the shows wherever you can. Follow us on Twitter at Snake Bros with no vowels, S N K B R S. Join the Facebook group run by Jordan. Join the Discord chat. There is a link to that on the website. Uh, we got a lot of people in the Discord, and it's yeah. constantly going these days. George it's, is in there. George is in there. Yeah. Uh, and also, the Library of the Serpent is linked on the website, which is run by Jeff, who also runs the Discord chat. Thank you so much. That's right. And History Shift, who makes all of our YouTube videos. You can find him on YouTube and on Twitter. Also, Pod Doodles. Find him on YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, and don't forget about Cosmographia, the podcast we make with Randall Carlson. And we have a subreddit r forward slash brothers of the serpent give us updates <clears throat> and thanks to everybody who contributes to the value for value model that's right here at uh, brothers of the serpent podcast we, that's right we appreciate you so much we do and thanks also to where did the road go uncharted x mike and maurice's mind escape the c word podcast Grime america conspiracy normal and the cosmic tusk yes thank you guys so much and all of you listeners out there this is our you. favorite time of the week we love you always have always will Good night, Adamu. Get back to work and don't die from the virus from space. Mm-hmm.